took one city from Southern California, one from Northern California, of two completely different sizes that had each passed inclusionary zoning ones. Then we picked two other cities in the state to compare it to who don't have inclusionary zoning. I mean, look, they produce the same. Uh -huh. well, how many jurisdictions do we have in California? <laughs> and how long would it take to come up with a comparison that anybody could get something, you know, the data to say that? Yeah, that's the one thing that people aren't, don't trust about data is there's ways to tweak data to make it come out however you want. That's, you know? that's possible, but the interesting thing besides this one study that Ben was talking about, which in my opinion is kind of silly, uh, besides that <laughs> there have been no empirical studies on this issue. So people for the past 30 years have been saying, yes, this does not restrict the supply of housing. And we ask, well, where's your evidence for this? And none of them had it. Actually, the evidence that they give is, well, in 1990, we had X amount of jurisdictions with inclusionary zoning. Today, we have over 100. Look, we've increased the number of jurisdictions with this policy. Therefore, it's a success. <laughs> As if just passing a law makes something a success. This is the mindset of these people. So when we looked at it in the Bay Area, we took every city with inclusionary zoning and said, this city, year before, year after, when they adopted it, what happened to housing production? Three years before, three years after, seven before, seven after, so that we're comparing the same city with what it was doing before and after. Then we're taking all 40 cities who have done this and comparing before and after each individual year so you're not getting something like you know a business cycle or an economic downturn that's gonna make it look this way. Mm -hmm. And then you average them all together and then you get 30%, not 1%, not 2% drop, mm -hmm. 30%. What is the uh, level of uh, accuracy of that? I mean, all statistics like that, 4% off, 5% off, maybe? Yeah, when you have that many cities, you get in the basic idea of it right. You got it, it's a large magnitude, it's not an in, inconsequential thing, because we measure the size of the tax that they're putting on. The tax per market rate home, and this you can actually measure by looking how restrictive the regulation is, compare what the builders have to sell the price controlled home for with the market rate home. Found out average Bay Area city, $44,000 is the tax for each market rate unit in order to provide those subsidized ones. So when we're looking at this bigger tax, we're expecting a pretty mm -hmm. good response in the supply side. And again, going back to the believability of you know what you're saying, you as economists want to have your work, you're basically selling your work in a sense as an economist and because it's part of your reputation. If a bunch of other people look at your work, the left or the right or the center or whatever, and say this is inaccurate, it doesn't work, no one's going to listen to the next thing that you do. I mean, as economists, you know, you want to be well-known, famous economists that are listened to. You know, it's not like you're being a rock star, but, you know, of course, the, the most famous economist, Milton Friedman, is very respected people, people, a person. People want to be, he won a Nobel Peace Prize in economics. People in any field want to be seen as being, uh, uh, they want to be known in their field and they want to be seen as being accomplished. So you're going to want your data to be accurate. You're not going because you're, you're selling it in a sense. I mean, you're not actually selling it to people, but you're selling it in a way that you want to keep your positions. Your reputation for future your jobs, reputation. for future publishing, for everything matters. And we're obviously, we have a lot of career left in us. There's no point <laughs> in blowing it now. Although I'm still not giving up on a rock star. You know, McGregor had a graduate economics degree. But that's, you know, one of the problems that I get is first getting people to look at economic information. But now there are so many think tanks. And the think tanks are competing. And the thing they're competing for is believability. The thing they're competing for is to make sure no one thinks that their data is just left or right wing propaganda. And that is something that is making uh, certain think tanks be kind of go under, kind of be seen as left or right wing cranks and other think tanks being listened to. Because again, there, you can get people on all spectrums to listen to. Because I did see this data in the LA Times. And I've seen this data in other more right wing publications and I've seen it in more kind of left wing sources. And pretty much it's being believed. What's different Wait. about your data? That, that it is being believed. Our data is out there for one thing. So if anybody didn't believe the statistics, they can run their own regressions. Mm -hmm. And to date, nobody has. So uh, that is one thing. We have studied 30, uh, well, 45 cities in the Bay Area. And we looked at it over a 30 year period. So it's not just a matter of us picking two random cities. And we're very explicit with the methodology. And you mentioned that there's been 
different newspapers who have picked it up. So mm -hmm. San Francisco Chronicle, yeah. San Jose Mercury News, we, Oakland Tribune. Bo both perspectives have, have published our results in their newspapers. The Chronicle, the Merck News, these guys on one side, but then the Orange County Register on the more traditionally market mm -hmm. or right-wing side has published an op-ed by us, the SAC B. It, it's got around. Everybody's interested in it. And actually, we got pretty favorable reports from even the most anti-market newspapers. Uh, because a lot of people are just genuine. Affordability isn't really a left-right type issue. It's an issue of, do you care about home affordability? And for the most part, people on the left who are usually command and control status sometimes say, well, if there's a better way to do it, eh, maybe we should look at better ways. Uh, if only we could get them to think of that more often. And the right-wing people, too, I don't want, I shouldn't, I would actually like to comment to the, the idea that some of the th think tanks are too right-wing, too, I mean, right-wing and left-wing, these are confusing They're political confusing. groups that have a mix of status mixed into each of them. Basically, our message, and if there's think tanks, and some do, support the view that markets work, it's not very surprising we're finding markets working in housing, markets work in other areas, too. So, why is this getting, this is kind of the first Study of its kind? The only empirical study. People have been talking about this issue for, well, non-economists have been talking about this issue for 20 years and thinking, oh, this is such a great idea. And unfortunately, no economists have actually studied it. Huh. And I was just surprised to see that over half the cities in the Bay Area now have price controls on a percentage of new housing. And I was just shocked. How come economists have not been <laughs> Telling the public about this, so that was kind of, part of the reason. Might, part of the reason might be because we all pretty much agree price right. controls don't work, so it's not that theoretically interesting to come out and say it. Nixon, you know, tried this in the uh, in the early '70s, price controls and and other things, and they were a disaster. Price controls are a failure wherever they're implemented, and I don't see why they're going to be successful now. Why do we have to keep relearning this? I heard the great line from the Reason Foundation that said that economist's role is like someone in the movie The Groundhog Day, where you wake up every single day <laughs> and you have to explain basic economic principles to the public every single day for the rest of your life. And I think part of it, too, is a lot of the public gets it, but not everything gets translated through the political policy process to politicians. To politicians, if they can price control homes and then a certain percentage of people get these special low rate ones, now all of a sudden it ma matters who gets their application under the solicitor's door, you know, early mm -hmm. enough in the morning, the town clerk's office. They get favors to hand out. So a lot of them have an incentive to not quite learn or maybe ignore what's been said. Well, well thank you both for coming out. It's been wonderful. It's been informative. If anyone else out there would like any more information about the Libertarian Party, and a party that supports learning about economics and applying it concretely to make your life better, go to www.lp.org. You can join us there online, or you can give us a call at 1-800-ELECT-US. That's toll free and we'll send you out a free packet of information. So please register to vote as a libertarian. Next time you're at the post office waiting in line for a half an hour to buy just one stamp, just, just Register to vote as a libertarian, and we'll see you next time on The Libertarian Alternative. Thanks for watching. Don't give up.